So once again, thank you everybody for coming and uh, very lovely to be here once more in this beautiful Vihara, beautiful hall. And uh, today, as uh, perhaps some of you have read, I've decided to share about the, a little bit about the purpose and the practicing of peace in relation to this week we have just had the International Day of Peace on Wednesday the 21st and this is an important uh, event that is shared throughout the world at the same time or the same day. Of course there is a day's different difference in some parts of the world but um, it is still at this time. I won't speak a lot about the Buddha on this subject, however, you know, the Buddha's fundamental goal in Buddhism, of course, is about peace, bringing peace firstly within ourselves, then within our homes, our communities, societies, and it spreads into the world very much. This is a practice that's developed through the loving-kindness practice and uh, the very simple words of may you be well, may I be well, may I be happy and contented and may I be safe and protected and may I live with ease and in peace and this again we reflect out to others our family and others in the broader community and then out into the world. So this is a very fundamental part and practice of the Buddha's teaching. But it is also a part of most religions and most human values in, in the greater society. In the Dhammapada, which is often attributed to words of the Buddha, it is said that better than a thousand useless words is one useful word that on hearing it one becomes enlightened. This is quite a Zen approach really when we think of the great stories in Zen where there was the one finger, the one word, the one action that <coughs> helped the, the practitioner dive deeply within to realize the core of their essential nature, the core of their capacity to be enlightened. And uh, the Buddha in teaching that a peaceful mind that has arisen from peaceful speech, peaceful thoughts, when reached out in a peaceful action, one peaceful action can liberate many. And I would touch here on a story that inspired me before I came to Buddhism. And it was the actions of a woman by, by the name of Peace Pilgrim. Has anyone in this room heard her name? Ah, of course Judith will have. So, Peace Pilgrim was a woman who in her twenties decided to stand and make a statement for peace. It was the time of the Korean War in 1953 at the age of 27 wearing a very simple garment that she wore for the next 30 years, a little blue suit, little garment, with one pocket. And on it, who was her name, Peace Pilgrim, on the back, walking 24,000 miles for peace. And over the next 24,000 plus miles, she walked back and forth across America. They don't know exactly how many times. The basic analysis is seven or eight, but they suspect it was many more, some say up to 20. 
And in this time, she would be sometimes picked up at a spot, taken to offer a meal or lodging for the night, and brought back to that spot. And she continued her walk. She kept one little notebook, and I believe one change of underwear, and that was it. There was nothing else on her. I think there was uh, something like one or two dollars, which it was necessary for a phone call, but not, carried no other money. And in this uh, example of an action, in practicing peace, she touched countless lives. At that time, there were articles written about her talks. So when she was invited to various places, universities and schools and clubs and groups, she was picked up on the side of the road, taken, she would give a talk, often offered a meal and lodging and brought back. But many a night she spent on the side of the road. I read her book when I was a young adult and she would spend this time in meditation and developing this inner peace. And she talks in depth about this development of her inner peace. Now can I ask everybody to put their phones away, please? It is a time to be here and listen to a Dharma talk. Thank you. And her book shares many stories of very difficult confrontations of people who had ill intent and how in the meeting of these people their minds were not only stabilized and stilled but brought into a place of contentment and acceptance and peace and so their thoughts of ill will, their thoughts of doing something that may have brought harm changed through the development of the heart and mind of this person. And I wanted to just touch on her because she inspired me in the early 70s when I was walking for peace for Vietnam. <laughs> And many, some of you will have been doing that too, walking against the war and the conscription of Australians in this war. I read this book and thought at that age, in my early 20s, whatever we do, if we can do it with a mind that is of no harm, which is a core teaching of the Buddha's teaching, a mind that brings no harm to both, not only a human, but all sentient beings. Then this mind will carry deeply into the hearts of others. And I used to walk at that time many, many miles. I would take a little backpack and go walking and camping along old disused tra uh, railway lines or along beaches. And I never had a sense of fear at that time, you know. I'm not sure if I would do it today, but I'm not sure if Peace Pilgrim will be walking today given the environment we're in. I'm not, that would be an amazing challenge. But um, her example through her actions, those she attracted on the path, many would come and walk with her for a day, those she would teach in the evenings, and there's even foundations that continue her work now, a park in her name, a beautiful peaceful park in the name of Peace Pilgrim. And she died. How can you imagine she died? She died in a car accident, coming back to the place where she was to continue her work. After she had comp completed the official 24,000 kilometers, it was like she had done her work, and the car 
had a collision in which the occupants were killed. Ironic, no incidents on the side of the road. She never suffered rape, abuse in 30 years of walking for peace. And I will tell you another story at the end of this talk which also reflects such a courageous, honest, open, integral action. But there are many who we know, you know, great teachers like the Dalai Lama who have dedicated their walk their, their, sorry, their actions and their work for peace. And he says human beings, indeed all sentient beings, have the right to pursue happiness and live in peace and live in freedom. It sounds a simple statement. He is saying, indeed, we would expect this is the case. We should be able to do this. But what prevents it? What stops it happening even in our own households? If we look at the news every day, it is anything but peace. From the front of the paper to the back. <laughs> or, uh, you know, I watch, see a few headlines on my internet. It would suggests that even in our tiny little part of the world we have a lot of work to do. And where does it start? Thich Nhat Hanh says peace is every step. If we are peaceful, if we are happy, we smile and, the blossom, and we blossom like a flower and everyone in every family, in our whole entire society will benefit from that peace. I mean his work too has been a simple message of bringing it into again every step, again in how we speak, reflecting on where it comes from within our life and our practice. I looked after um, Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh in Korea many years ago. He came to visit my nun teacher's temple with his, his uh, traveling community at that time. And he was a very still person. His mindful practice was very present in everything he did. If he spoke there was a moment of silence before he opened his mouth. If he gave a Dharma talk, he would walk in very mindfully. But he was also very direct. He came to my teacher and she was the abbess at that time of this very large community, 250 nuns. And he came and I had to translate and he said, tonight at this time I will give a Dharma talk. Please gather everyone together. She was a little surprised and uh, she acknowledged okay. And he, he stayed in her little, her little compound. I mean she moved out to stay with the nuns. She gave him her, her lovely compound where she lived. But she wasn't allowed to go and visit even without having made an appointment and a time of which he would come down. So he had very strict regulations and protocol that would keep in place his development and his teachings of this way of peace, being peace. Robert Fulgram says, peace is not something you wish for, it's something you make, it's something you do. <coughs> Certainly, we can inspire our actions through the thoughts. Creating peaceful thoughts will go a long way. 
But it is not just enough to do that, but it is something you must do and something you must become. Other teachers have talked about this becoming as in you speak peace, you think peace, you eat peace, you sleep peace. You walk peace, you talk peace. That is not so easy to do. From morning to night. We all have moments in the day where we feel peaceful, happy, content. But a very large part of the day we're dialoguing about who did this or that or, you know, didn't do this or that. And less peaceful thoughts are there too. And then he says, when you gain this within your life, within your actions, you must give it away. You don't hang on to it as mine. Just as my joy and my happiness, my contentment. That's just another development of the eye, another development of self-interest and self-possessiveness. It is something you do in relationship to and you give it away. You give yourself fully to other, whatever other is. It may be a thing as in a tool or a practice we do where we develop an art, a skill and we give ourselves fully. I know sometimes when I've been working on this hall, you know, and I do a little woodwork, I get so en engaged in it that my mind gets so connected with what I'm doing. This peace develops. The sense of stillness and connection and belonging develop. Peace is the only battle worth waging, says Albert Camus. The only battle. Nothing else should be a battle in our life other than this work of connecting and bringing peace into our heart. You know when you sit in meditation there are a lot of battles. We have battles just to sit here. This ache comes and that anxiety arises and fears arise. And we just sit. We're all of it. And these are our battles. When we hear something we don't like, or we become anxious about the actions of others that's around us. Our children are doing extraordinarily, what can you say, to us maybe frightening, but experimenting in ways that we would think, my goodness, Will they survive it? And we have to find peace with that. We have to see peace in those battles, those everyday challenges, those everyday disruptions in our life that we don't understand fully. And I know that when I have felt very connected and deeply at ease within myself, the troubles out there don't seem so problematic and troublesome. And when situations have erupted unexpectedly, I felt contained enough to embrace them and be with them and listen to them talk with them, 
talk to them. Peace Pilgrim touched on this a lot in her, her teachings. What allowed her to get through a lot of difficult situations was the capacity to speak peace. To speak from the heart and take a genuine interest in other. Albert Einstein says peace cannot be kept by force. We cannot control it. It can only be achieved by understanding. It's very similar to the Buddha's teachings. It requires understanding. That's why the teachings are so important. When we understand how we can utilize these teachings in our life in every situation, then we not only find peace for ourselves, but we also share that understanding with others. Whether it is in a way that's verbalized or not, our understanding is what is shared. That is what the Buddha didn't have to talk all day, he often didn't. As I mentioned from the Diamond Sutra, when he came and he sat after the dana, practice of dana, and putting away his robes, and he would come and he would sit in the posture of meditation. He would focus his eyes before him, openly, gently, not pushing anything away, not looking at anything in particular. And he would steady his mind in this place. Now sometimes he spoke and sometimes often he didn't. He just sat there. And that peace was enough radiating out to his community of monks, nuns and lay people. It was enough. Martin Luther King says one day we must come to see that peace is not merely a distant goal that we seek but it means by which but it is the means by which we arrive at that goal. You know, we often see, wouldn't it be wonderful to have a peaceful world? What does that mean? At the, um, the gathering they had, I couldn't make it this year, but last year I, I went at the, um, in the city. They have early in the morning a meditation for peace by members of various faith groups and some from other organizations, leaders of peace movements and organizations. And this is held in the Federation Square in a beautiful big forum there. And it's, oh, with beautiful harp music, it's, you know, made to be like a heavenly realm. Well, last year, apart from us in this beautiful ceremony, and there was hardly anyone in the audience. So I'm curious to hear if more people came. I mean, mind you, it's 7.30 in the morning. But it was a very beautiful act of coming together and sitting in meditation and listening to wonderful words. And in itself, that is a, a very important gathering and such gatherings would be held around the world and throughout the day. But it is not the goal. The goal, of course, we have this intention and we hope that peace will pervade and grow. But the actual means is the capacity of people coming from various walks of life, various traditions, and in this case, sitting together, sitting still. And it is just offering one means, one practice, one way to do it. But here Martin Luther King says, we must pursue peaceful ends through peaceful means. We must pursue our intentional goals 
through our actions now. Little by little, drop by drop, how we walk, how we talk, and how we do things that reflect peace in the world. And this is what the Buddha talks about throughout all his teachings, throughout all his actions, the whole of that first chapter in the Diamond Sutra of how he picks up his ball, how he puts on his robe, how he steps out of his kuti, how he walks, how he stands. All of this is the practice. We're not all monks doing pindapato every day, but we are people doing people things Getting up in the morning, you know, you get up half asleep and you shuffle around your feet looking for slippers and then you sort of, you know, with your head down, still asleep, you shuffle off to the bathroom. <laughs> it may seem there's a sort of peace in that, but there's not. There's just a stupefying, lethargic, sleepy mind and that actually often carries through our day we get in the car and then we you know start looking at the guys next to us who are doing silly things on the road somebody went in front of me with two big bikes on a trailer on the back I tell you there wouldn't have been an inch I think he forgot he had a trailer with bikes on the back <laughs> And I had to watch my mind go, what are you doing, mate? You know, <laughs> it jumps out and I caught it quickly and I went, oh, Sunday morning, uh, you know, early Sunday morning, still asleep, late night last night. You bring understanding. You bring a possibility of why people may do what they do. And that actually stops us going to a, a mental rage about the stupidity we do, and we all do it. Not just them, not just him. But I do it too. Peace is not an absence of war. It is a virtue, a state of mind, a disposition for benevolence and confidence. By Baruch Spinozola. I don't know all these people but they say interesting things. It's not just about the absence of war. There's always war. But it is virtue, a state of mind, a disposition for benevolence and for developing confidence. It says a lot, actually. John F. Kennedy said, but peace does not rest in the character or the covenants loan. I apologize. Peace does not rest in the charters and the covenants alone. It lies in the hearts and minds of all people. So let us not rest all our hopes on the parchments and on the paper. Let us strive to build peace, a desire for peace, a willingness to work for peace in the hearts and minds of all our people. I believe that we can. I believe the problem of human destinies are not beyond the reach of human beings. And that's a very big state statement. The fact that we choose to enter this world with all the difficulties and all the experiences we have brought with us from our past existences, still we choose to come back. Knowing it is not going to be an easy run. But we have the capacity. Peace may sound simple, one beautiful word, but it requires everything we have. 
every equality, every strength, every dream, every high ideal. And I would add to that, it requires our intention for, our intention to do, our intention to be better, be kinder, be awake, even just to become a little more awake. So then when we wake up in the morning, our eyes are open and we go, oh wow, how extraordinary, I'm here today. I didn't go last night, I'm, I got at least this breath with me. That requires us to be a little bit more attentive and awake. That was by Yehudi Menuhm. It is possible to live in peace again, is the message by Mahatma Gandhi. It is possible. The Buddha lived to share that message. It is possible for us to be liberated, which is the final and the greatest peace. It is possible to reach Nibbana. Or in the Zen way of saying, it is possible to empty out our illusory, delusory, ignorant self. And Kofi Annan, Kofi Annan was a very great leader in the UN. There is no trust more sacred than the one the world holds with children. There is no duty more important than ensuring that their rights are respected and their welfare is protected and that their lives are free from fear and want so they can grow up in peace. It's really every child's right. There was a beautiful little um, letter written by a boy, you may have seen it in the news, to the little boy who um, had suffered in uh, the, the bombings and whose family, some of his family were killed and this little boy was quite hurt and put into a into medical van and he's just sitting there with blood and he says it all about the situation and this little boy in America writes a letter and he says please come and live with us he invites him into the, his family you know here you'll be peaceful and he, in, in a little way, the way a little boy would think, you know, what he and his sister are going to give to this other child, what they're going to share, and how they could offer him a family. And uh, Barack Obama was so touched by it, he read it out. But this is how we should think, how we should not look at the differences. On the other side there's very extreme far-right people who are making many differences, many problems. And this is by Black Ilk. He was the very, he lived to be over a hundred. He, um, he was an Indian, a great peace-loving Indian. First, the first peace and it sounds very Buddhist, this, the first peace, which is the most important, like the first taste of liberation, is that which comes within the minds of people when they realize their relationship, their oneness with the universe and all its powers. And when they realize that the center of the universe is really everywhere, and is with each, in each of us. That very first taste of that. 
inspires this sense of connection, this sense of belonging, this sense of purpose. And this is within each of us, he says. And Walt Whitman says, peace is always beautiful. What is beautiful is peaceful. What is peaceful is beautiful. That is the, that is the thing that happens with bliss. <laughs> People get a taste of bliss and then they <clears throat> get attached to the beauty and the sweetness of it. But it is very peaceful because it is very peaceful. Now the last person I would like to conclude this talk and sharing was a very great monk who I met on several occasions and I'll give a little bit about his story. His name was Mahagoshananda. Now he has a title which I unfortunately didn't put here but he was from Cambodia and Mahagoshananda began his um, his life in the monastery very young at about the age of eight just as a temple boy living in the temple and helping do whatever so he had family but he lived in the temple and then as a teenager he went, he became a monk and he went to study Buddhism in India. He was a great scholar. Now I met him in the 80s first. We had a very big conference in Korea which I ended up doing a lot of work for, a World Fellowship of Buddhist Conference. And it was the first one. They've had at least one more since then. And the World Fellowship of Buddhist is a very large organization of Buddhists throughout the world that come together in different countries but it's primarily housed in Thailand and at this conference you know Korea was still living very much in this uh, um, there's a sort of a hierarchical where we say a high class of low class of people but the the land of many bosses so the idea of an organization of a big organization coming and doing a conference in Korea was great. They all bought into it. But nobody in that top body thought about the practicalities of it. So myself and Mujin Snim and several other lay Western people, we did a lot of the groundwork. You know, they hadn't really organized the bus systems or the collections from airports or so and the we had to do we did the the book and the news we did a little newspaper every day so we had to do a lot of the very ground basic things and I was one of the rappers and Mahagoshananda came to this conference he turned up in a taxi and then when he arrived at the hotel I realized the taxi hadn't been paid <laughs> he stood there and he said he called out to him and Mahagoshananda just got out of the taxi and continued walking <laughs> and and I had to you know pull out of a pocket some money for the taxi driver so then I realized oh this is interesting you know so I took him up to his room and he was just a very simple you know open beautiful open smiling face and another time the next time when he was about to get in a taxi I quickly said to the taxi driver here's some money for his fare <laughs> take him to where he wants to go you know uh, <clears throat> and so he was just sort of a very understated very quiet but present person in my mind at that time and I had this sense of looking after him you know making sure he had the things he needed and you know did he need more water or did he need something so I did this you know with a thousand monks there for some reason I felt this one I have to look after a little bit more and uh, and with no asking no expectation no requesting now some years later 
I met him, he came to another little mini conference, The World is a Single Flower. I think I've talked about this, where I held up a flower and in my little two-minute speech, he asked about this flower, you know. We see its beauty, we smell its beauty. But can we hear it? The smell, the, the, the touch, the sense of observation is all very beautiful, but can we hear its suffering? That was a little inquiry I brought up about this. And he was sitting there and he looked at me with a big smile. He was just in front, looked at me with a very big smile. And he nodded deeply, you know. And later, <clears throat> didn't say very much, but came up and said that was good. The message was important because that flower is all of us. Are we listening to the suffering of us all? Are we listening to the suffering within ourselves? And later when we had a photo taken, it was in front of one of those great big paintings that they have in Korea with all the different, you know, teachers and deities in the, in the Mahayana Buddhism. And we, all the rest of us who are in this Zen conference, all standing out like characters with big noses, but individuals. And when you look for Mahagoshananda in the picture, it was hard to see him. You really had to look because he became one of the deities in the painting. I have this painting, I might show it one day. He just blended into the painting. You know, all those other faces in the painting, and here's one of a live person. Very hard to see it, only that the rest of us with our great big egos all standing out, very pronounced and very full of ourselves. And here's one individual who just was there in peace and blended in with the environment. And I have met him on other occasions, but <clears throat> those two were quite a reminder. Now, his story is that after he went to India, he <clears throat> came back to study meditation. And um, he went to Thailand and he studied with Bhikkhu Buddhadasa, the great Thai Buddhist um, exponent of com contemplative meditation and also social engagement. And then he did a five-year retreat with Achan Damodaro, who was a great meditation master who berated him as a parrot. He said to scholarly Koshinanda, he said, you are a parrot who needs to supplement his learning, your learning with the experience, deep experience of meditation. So he stayed with him for another five-year retreat. And during this time, the killing fields in Cambodia took place. And he wanted to leave to help his family and go back to his homeland to do something. And, um, you know, knowing that the Khmer Rouge genocide was taking place. But he was um, asked to continue to meditate and find that peace in your own heart so you can deal with this, really deal with it. And he did. He lost uh, 16, all members of his family, including 16 siblings. Ev 16 siblings. Every single one of his family were, were killed. And he, um, he came to live <coughs> in America. And I heard this story from... <laughs> Um, the Korean Zen master, Venerable Sung uh, Sang Sanim. And Sung Sang Sanim said one day he arrived at the airport in Los Angeles or in America somewhere, and sitting there was a little monk in an orange robe, just sitting in the airport. And he went up to him and he said, Is someone looking after you, Venerable? 
and it was Mahagoshananda. And Mahagoshananda said, no. He said, are you expecting anyone? He said, no. He said, have you got anywhere to go? He said, no. So he got off a plane, landed in an airport and just sat and again allowed the universe to look after him. And he went to live with Sung Sung Snim, the, the most unlikely of couples. Sung Sung Snim is a very full of life character, you know, loud booming voice and only don't know, you know, and do this, do this, no, you know, like this. <laughs> And here's Goshananda, who lived with him for a long time until he established his own Khmer community. And they became the best of friends, so that's how I got to meet him at the conference in Korea. And then <clears throat> Ma Goshananda, well, he went on to become a very, in his understated way, probably one of the most... Uh, esteemed um, and passionate uh, people for peace. He was nominated four times for the Nobel Peace Prize for doing many extraordinary works. He, um, and apart from founding temples in Cambodia in America, he led the um, congenant of Buddhist monks to the UN and to sponsor the Cambodian peace negotiations. So he was right there at the forefront of the peace negotiations. He was elected as the Supreme Patriarch of Cambodia in 1989. And when he was, I mentioned earlier, when he was um, a scholar in, in India, he met a Japanese monk who was part, I don't know if I've got it written here and it's probably in all the little writing I can't see, but he was part of um, a Japanese sect that used to travel around the world and chant for peace. And um, he started to travel with this monk. And so he travelled many times, the two of them, through Cambodia, leading large numbers of people to and chanting for peace. He went through the killing fields, he went through the mines and he would bring all, still at this time there were the factions of the different fighters, he would bring them together and teach the Dharma and they would lay down their weapons and take the precepts again from him. And he did this on many occasions. Not once did anyone get blown up. And this was when the country was still very raw. And he was a leading figure in the engaged Buddhist movement and he was one of the founders of the, um, the INEB, the International Network of Engaged Buddhists, with Thich Nhat Hanh, with the Dalai Lama. And we always hear about Thich Nhat Hanh and the Dalai Lama. And, uh, and uh, earlier I was talking with Venerable Jack. I said, have you heard of Ma Venerable Ma Goshananda? He said, no. I said, oh, he's someone worth having a look at. An extraordinary man. But again, this very understated physical presence. Very gentle, very sweet. If you see his pictures, he all looks like an old lady. Just a sweet face, open with no shadow, no hiding of anything. And he was also um, given a very fa prestigious peace award in, um, for human rights in both Japan and Norway. Um, some conservative monks did criticize him for not for his activism. But he never worried. He was not a person who stayed in one place. He would go and teach, even in America. He, he wasn't about making my temple, making golden temples. He was about sharing peace and the importance of it. And the 
devastation of war. He spoke, well here it says 10 languages. I've heard he spoke 16 languages. So an incredible mind. And if you asked him about Cambodia's future, he would reply, take care of the present mo moment and the future will take care of itself. He was very sort of simple. If you ask questions, you've got a very simple little answer. And he wrote several books, one in, in 1992, Step by Step, which expresses his faith in profound influence of apparently a simple comment on peace and personal transformation. So how to develop that peace within that makes a difference out there. And he's a wonderful example of that. He wrote this poem, Cambodia has suffered deeply from a deep sea of suffering comes deep compassion. From deep compassion comes a peaceful heart. From a peaceful heart comes a peaceful person. And from a peaceful person comes a peaceful family and community. And from a peaceful community comes a peaceful nation. And from a peaceful nation comes a peaceful world. And I think that <clears throat> that poem really says um, a lot in this story on peace. And so I might end it there so you might have a few questions. Um, but I do suggest if you have not heard of him, Google. At least have a look at his face. It's worth seeing that light. And uh, yes, yes, Ben. You are talking very relevant today. The peace in the world or the community or individual peace is uh, broken by fear. The yes. Fear the yes, it is very much. Fear, fear is the greatest problem. Yes, yeah. They force to have fear of our own. Yes. The community, they are fearful of other people. Like yes. Individuals who are fearful of home invasion. Yes, yeah. Well, and the fear comes from ignorance. And, you know, coming back to that point about learning and understanding. You know, when we, um, when we really try to understand where people's ignorance comes from, of course it comes from fear, but it also is ingrained in a history of family abuse, of family ignorance, of lack of education, of poverty, of, um, you know, power, insecurity, but a lot, you will see nations that are living in fear. We've got children in Syria who are born in the war. They know nothing but war. You know, they have no sense of what peace is, other than if they have a parent who often a father has taken away tortured and killed you know if they've stayed in Syria for children this is a uh, very very institutionalized yes my question is can you overcome this by carrying guns or building fences around houses no of course not you know the again that is the basis of of the um, the very small majority, a very small number of powerful people in government who are f fear monger large numbers of people and also this um, extreme radicalization, extreme right views that see us and them as enemies. We're seeing it now here in Australia, you know very ignorant people who are attracting other ignorant people through fear-mongering. The, the weapons is the, the means to, you know, to add, that's right, to accentuate the problem.